Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Last time in this archosaur related series, we examined the odd beaked rhynchosaurs, which were among the most derived of all archosauromorphs. Indeed, depending on the study concerned, there may only be three genera within this group that are more derived. Prolacerta, Cadimacara, and Tasmaniosaurus. These animals possess body plans and lifestyles far more typical of early archosauromorphs, being somewhat lizard-like and carnivorous. I'll begin with the first two genera, which are sometimes grouped into the family Prolacertidae. The type genus of this putative family is Prolacerta itself. Found in the lower Triassic rocks of South Africa and Antarctica, the only known species is Prolacerta brumi. This would have been a small reptile, not much larger than a bearded dragon, with a slender body, elongated neck, and narrow toothy jaws. The animal is arguably the most well-represented stem archosauriform, with numerous well-preserved specimens housed in various research institutions in South Africa, Europe, and the United States. Despite resembling squamates in certain ways, several cranial and postcranial features set Prolacerta apart from lizards, and instead show that it was a relative of crown archosaurs. Some of these notable features include elongated cervical vertebrae with elongate thickened neural spines, which gave Prolacerta a slightly elongated neck and a wide range of flexibility. Cranial features include thecodont teeth, a feature observed in all ancestors of crown archosaurs, which were pointed and caniniform in shape. Prolacerta was probably a small, active terrestrial carnivore or insectivore due to its fang-like teeth of roughly the same size and shape. It is considered to have been a quadruped, although due to its hind limbs being larger and longer than its front limbs, there is a possibility that it was habitually bipedal during periods of high activity, like some modern lizards today. Later, more derived archosaurs would further build on this trait with tremendous success. A suggested close relative of Prolacerta was the genus Cadimacara. Known from the early Triassic of Queensland, Australia, this animal was described on the basis of a single partial skull with associated teeth. Not much about Cadimacara is known beyond this, but it seems likely that it was very similar to Prolacerta, although only about half the size. Like its sister genus, this was a carnivorous and or insectivorous animal. Considering that these two genera were both small, lizard-like animals, and that they were close to the ancestry of the more derived archosauriforms, this creates the possibility that the common ancestor of the lines leading to dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilians was rather tiny. The final archosauromorph to be covered in this video will be Tasmaniosaurus. This genus is notable not only due to being one of the most complete Australian Triassic reptiles known, but also due to being a very close relative of Archosauriforms. Once believed to be a Proterosuchid, this taxon is now believed to have been an intermediate between advanced non-Archosauriform Archosauromorphs such as Prolacerta and basal Archosauriforms such as Proterosuchus. Features traditionally used to define Archosauria and later Archosauriforms such as the presence of an antorbital fenestra and serrated teeth, are now known to have evolved prior to these groups due to their presence in Tasmaniosaurus. The animal is known from a single partial skeleton. This holotype consists of various skull fragments, vertebrae, ribs, an interclavicle, and bones of the back legs. The specimen as a whole is jumbled and missing many elements, and some of the bones preserved within it have not been identified with absolute certainty. Even so, it is considered one of the most complete skeletons of any Triassic reptile unearthed in Australia. A few other bone fragments collected from Tasmania have been occasionally referred to this genus, but they are currently considered intermediate and lost. Overall, the animal would have somewhat resembled a very small crocodile, being of a similar size to Prolacerta but more heavily built. The teeth are blade-like and similar to those of living monitor lizards, suggesting that Tasmaniosaurus was a predator. Interestingly, despite the messy nature of the holotype, the well-preserved skull roof has allowed paleontologists to reconstruct the brain of this animal by utilising an endocast. This endocast showed that the specimen's brain had large olfactory bulbs at the front, which led into a thin olfactory tract in the middle and a somewhat wider cerebellum in the back. 
There are also wide and flat extensions at the front of the brain, which are separated from the olfactory bulbs by a small groove. These extensions may have been the edge of additional non-brain organs, such as a Jakobsen's organ, or alternatively another component of the olfactory bulbs, which would indicate that those parts of the brain were unusually large. Both of these interpretations have significant ramifications for the biology of this animal. If they are a Jakobsen's organ, then the notion that such an organ was not present in archosauromorphs can be proven false. This notion was originally formed due to the fact that neither crocodilians nor birds possess such an organ. However, Eskuren notes that both of these groups have specialised modes of life, which may have caused the organ to have been lost. If they are parts of the olfactory bulbs, then Tasmaniosaurus would have had a superb sense of smell. It has been noted that aquatic animals have generally diminished olfactory capabilities compared to their terrestrial counterparts. Thus, this interpretation significantly lowers the likelihood that Tasmaniosaurus or its relatives were mainly aquatic. And with that, we come to the base of the clade Archosauriforms. These reptiles, which include members of the family Proterosuchidae and more advanced forms, were originally superficially crocodile-like animals with sprawling gaits and long snouts. Unlike the bulk of their therapsid contemporaries, the Proterosuchids survived the catastrophe at the end of the Permian. Within a few million years after the beginning of the Triassic, the Archosauriforms had diversified past the Proterosuchian grade. Other Archosauriforms include the Erythrosuchidae, which were some of the earliest sauropsid apex predators, the small and agile Euparcaria, and a variety of other strange reptiles such as Proterochampsids, Van Clevia, Doswellia, and Asperoris. The most successful archosauriforms, and the only members to survive into the Jurassic, were the archosaurs themselves. Archosauria includes crocodilians, birds, and extinct relatives such as Aetosaurs, Rhyosuchids, pterosaurs, and non-avian dinosaurs. Traditionally, a single family sat at the base of archosauriforms, the Proterosuchids. However, this group of superficially crocodile-like animals may not be a natural grouping, with the number of genera contained within the family now whittled down to just two, Proterosuchus and Archosaurus. Originating during the late Permian and possessing a wide range, with fossils recovered from Europe, Africa, Australia and possibly South America, they survived the extinction event at the end of the Permian and went on to become the most successful large carnivores of the early Triassic. The type genus, and the best known overall, was Proterosuchus from the early Triassic of South Africa. This was a mid-sized quadrupedal reptile with a sprawling stance that could reach a length of up to 3.5 meters. It had a large head and distinctively hooked snout. It was a predator, which may have hunted prey such as the contemporary Lystrosaurus. The lifestyle of Proterosuchus remains debated. It may have been terrestrial, or it may have been a semi-aquatic ambush predator similar to modern crocodiles. Proterosuchus had a proportionately large head and long neck compared to its body. The most distinctive characteristic of its head was its strongly hooked snout, formed by a downturned premaxilla. The premaxilla contained up to nine teeth in adults, and the teeth in the snout tip were splayed out to the sides. The jaws of Proterosuchus contained numerous teeth, with up to 9 premaxillary, 31 maxillary, and 28 dentary teeth in each side. These teeth were recurved, compressed, and serrated, as in most archosauriforms. Proterosuchus has conventionally been depicted as a semi-aquatic ambush predator. However, it lived in an arid environment, and many aspects of its anatomy conflict with a semi-aquatic lifestyle. In particular, its limbs are well ossified, as in terrestrial animals, and the nostrils are laterally positioned on the snout, not dorsally, as we would expect. The histology of its bones are reminiscent of terrestrial animals, not semi-aquatic ones. However, support for a semi-aquatic lifestyle comes from its brain anatomy, which resembles semi-aquatic predators such as crocodiles more than it does terrestrial reptiles. The orientation of its ear canals suggests its neutral head posture had the snout angled upwards, which would have raised the nostrils high enough for the animal to breathe while largely submerged. Proterosuchus was certainly a predator though. 
but the specifics of its diet are not known. It has been suggested to have eaten fish, or the abundant contemporary Dicynodont Lystrosaurus. The function of the hooked snout in the animal is not fully known. The most likely use was in sexual or social signalling, similar to the hooked snout of male salmon. As the snout does not appear to have been sexually dimorphic, it may be an example of mutual sexual selection. The snout may have been used in a specialised method of predation, as it exhibits high resistance to dorsoventral bending. However, what this method may have been is unclear. The premaxillary teeth do not show wear facets and do not occlude with the teeth of the lower jaw, indicating that they were not used in any abrasive activities and could not have been used to grip prey. The snout tip did not have pressure receptors present in crocodilians and Spinosaurus. The metabolism of Proterosuchus is also debated. Like other archosauromorphs, Proterosuchus had a higher metabolic rate than extant ectothermic reptiles. Furthermore, Proterosuchus possessed fibrolamellar bone, indicative of a high growth rate and corresponding high metabolism. However, studies conflict on whether the metabolism of Proterosuchus was within the range of extant endotherms. Its metabolic rate was lower than most other archosauriforms, except for the ectothermic phytosaurs and crocodilians, which may have been an adaptation to a crocodile-like predatory strategy. Its close relative, Archosaurus, was a very similar animal from the latest Permian of Russia and Poland. In the past, several other genera were also assigned to Proterosuchidae, but are now considered to be basal archosauriforms outside the family. These include the dubious Anixodon, Blomosuchus, and Von Hunia. The better known genus Chasmatosuchus, while appearing very similar to Proterosuchids, is now placed outside them as a basal archosauriform of uncertain placement. The reign of notch-jawed animals such as these was quite brief, and they were soon outcompeted by more derived archosauriform predators, such as large erythrosuchids and proterochampsids of the Middle Triassic. Nonetheless, it was from proterosuchid-like ancestors that all later archosaurs evolved, including the lines that led to crocodilians and dinosaurs, including modern birds. In the eventual next video in this series, we will be covering some of the groups that replaced the proterosuchids, including oddball taxa such as Van Clevia. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be discussing the fossil history of hyenas and their extinct relatives. See you again soon. Cheerio.